Hi, I'm Ed Sperley. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Ben Levine, who's going to talk today about the impact of complexity on security. So Ben, as we get down into fairly complex SOCs, uh, AI chips with lots of different components in it, what's the impact on security? Yeah, there's sort of two problems with complexity when you're talking about security and a CPU and SOC, really any sort of system. One is just there's more things that can be insecure. So if you talk about having N components um, in your chip, you know, as N goes up, there are more things that may be potential vulnerabilities. But it's actually worse than that, because if you look at security vulnerabilities, they're often not just in a single component, they're in interactions between components. So for example, if you look at the, the meltdown vulnerability that was discovered in CPUs last year, it was an interaction between the branch prediction or speculative execution and the cache. And it wasn't that one or the other was inherently insecure, it was the interaction between the two they cause problems. So why now? We've been talking about security for years. What's changed? Well, one is I think we're just reaching levels of complexity that we haven't seen before. And these interactions, instead of going up with the number of components, they go up with the square of the number of components. So that the number of pieces in a CPU or in an SOC has gotten large enough that this interaction type of vulnerability is really starting to, to be a really more of a significant problem than it was before. Designers have to get N squared things right. An attacker only needs to find one thing to have a vulnerability. So the problem is just getting exponentially worse. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, happy to. So how big is the problem? Why don't we start in on where do you see the problem and then we'll move to how do we solve it? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem of complexity causing security vulnerabilities is one that's getting, as I said, exponentially worse. So just thinking conceptually, you know, if you look at uh, vulnerabilities on this axis, you know, security vulnerabilities, and then you look at complexity on this axis, the first order effect is just as things get more complex, there are more things that can go wrong. So it grows linearly as you get more complex you have more security vulnerabilities. But the other aspect is this idea of interactions between components making it worse. So that actually grows exponentially. So then you really have the sum of those two when you're talking about security vulnerabilities. And the reason that's a problem is, you know, if you look at any sort of system, um, it's getting more and more complex, whether it's a CPU, whether it's an embedded device of some sort, an SOC, you know, we have more and more resources more transistors with Ohm's law, um, you know, lower costs of components that enable us to package more in one device. Complexity is going up and up, and keeping up with all of those interactions between pieces of a, a device is really, really hard. And it gets even worse than that, right? Because now you're dealing with somebody does something differently. So you and I have the same cell phone, but we use them completely differently. We may use a device differently there's new software added in, so there's updates as you go along. So it's it's a fourth dimension on this whole thing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You have the same system that has a lot of complex interactions and inherent security vulnerabilities, and this, those just get amplified by all the different use cases and ways in which that particular device are used. You're absolutely right. There's a whole other dimension I could show on this chart showing how the uh, number of vulnerabilities is growing as the usage patterns change. And more and more devices are also connected both within a system and system to system, and you don't always know where they're connected to, right? Yeah, that's a big problem as well. So just by connecting a device either to the internet or to other devices within an ecosystem, you're dramatically exposing or expanding the attack surface because now someone doesn't need to be in possession of the device to attack it. They just need to be somewhere in the you know, ecosystem of things that are connected to that device. So now we have this hydra-headed problem. How do we solve it? Yeah, it, it's a very difficult problem, and I'm not going to say that there is a single solution to the problem. Um, but one approach you can take is sort of divide and conquer. So if you have a very complex system, rather than trying to make the entire thing secure, one approach is to say, okay, I'm going to identify the things that are really important from a security perspective, keys, credentials, decisions about access, things like that. And I'm going to partition those away from the rest of the system. 
So we can do something like this. You have a large system, and this is you know very simple, but you have your sort of general purpose processing, and then in a separate domain, you have your secure processing. And what I'm going to do is say, okay, I'm going to move all of my keys, I'm going to move all of my certificates, I'm going to move decisions about access to resources, I'm going to move all that into the secure processor. The general purpose processor, I can make that as complex as I want, I can optimize it for performance or low power or whatever I need to do, but I'm going to do things that are secure in this secure domain. And that includes connectivity. So I have you know, some, maybe a cell modem over here. That's going to be outside of the security domain. I can communicate between the outside world and the secure processor. The secure processor can be involved in uh, authentication and setting up secure communication channels, but that interface is still outside of the security domain. And then what goes in here, I keep simple. So I optimize it for security. I keep it simple and easy to validate. And I make sure that I'm designing that from the ground up specifically for security. I'm not trying to add security as an afterthought. I'm saying that this is the whole purpose of the secure domain is to protect the things that I care about in the system. And so what you're doing here is safeguarding the hardware. Now you have also data, which is increasingly valuable, that's moving from piece to piece. How do you safeguard the data in motion or even at rest? Yeah, great question. So, you know, there, there's a couple of different things you want to do with data. One is uh, protect the confidentiality of that data to make sure that people who can access it can't read it and do anything with it. So you do that by encryption. So you want to encrypt data at rest in particular. You may encrypt data in motion. To do encryption, though, it's not as simple as just having an, an encryption algorithm. You need keys to protect that data. And that's really the hard part of data confidentiality is managing those keys. And that's where your secure processor, secure root of trust can come into play. And it can manage keys. It can coordinate keys. So you have a server out here in the cloud, and I want to encrypt the data that passes through this cellular link to the cloud. Well, I need to have a key in the cloud that can decrypt the data, and I need to have a key in the chip here that can encrypt the data. And I need to keep these keys synchronized without exposing the keys. And to do that, you need some sort of secure root of trust to enable that secure data encryption. Does it change at all as we start moving into some of the uh, architectures on the edge, for example, which there is no basis for that, or AI architectures where these are custom design chips? Yeah, absolutely. So let me start with AI first. Um, AI is, is absolutely an area where there's a real need for security, and there's some different security challenges. Um, one is you've got different types of data that you're dealing with at different parts of the process. Uh, when you're talking about AI, you sort of can divide it into two phases. One is training, where you're building the model that you're going to use to classify things. And the other is inference, where you're classifying new data that's coming in. When you're training, it's important to protect the integrity of the data that's in your training set and make sure it's not being tampered with because that can change your model. So there you get into not necessarily data confidentiality, but protecting the integrity of data uh, and making sure that it's authentic. Then you develop a model, and that model is very proprietary, right? That's your secret sauce for your AI engine that you've spent a lot of time building that's going to determine the performance of your inference. So the model is something that needs to be protected. So you probably want to encrypt that when it's in rest and only decrypt it when you actually need to use it. And then when you're doing inference, you're also working with data that may be sensitive. So for example, if it's a cloud AI that's processing uh, voice commands from a smart speaker, you know, the data is being sent is, is you know, what's being heard in someone's house, right? So you need to protect the, the confidentiality of that data. And that's very important. And you may have many, many users that are you know, being processed at the same time, and they need to have their data kept separate and kept confidential. So AI definitely um, you know, presents a lot of challenges. And, and not to say that any one solution is a panacea, because it isn't, 
But again, some sort of security of trust that can manage the keys, that can authenticate data, that can verify that data hasn't been tampered with, that's an important part of that whole solution. So the nice thing is AI chips um, are custom chips and there's the ability to add this sort of secure root of trust uh, to those chips from the outset. Is that happening? A lot of the effort that's going into these chips is actually just to get them running and working and moving the data as quickly as possible. Are they really thinking about security? We have been talking to companies that are definitely interested in security, and I think that's going to be a key differentiator as well. Um, as these sorts of applications become more and more well-established, people are going to be more aware of the security implications of AI and start to really care if they're buying products that do protect the security, not only of the company that's producing the AI device, but also of their users. So companies that are making AI chips that can say that they are you know, provably secure I think are going to have a real advantage. What's the overhead in terms of power performance and also time to uh, market on as you start building in security? Um, so there, there is some overhead. We're talking about gates. We're talking about some area overhead, some power. If you're looking at something like an AI chip, though, the, the area and power that we're talking about is really negligible. It's tiny. And, and even in smaller devices, you know, we're, we're you know, a, a, a good root of trust is going to be uh, much smaller than an application processor or another piece of complex IP. So the, the you know, cost-benefit ratio is actually pretty good. You're getting a lot of security value from a relatively small piece of hardware. And it, it's important that it's small, because I was talking about the problems with complexity. If you have a really big, complex root of trust, you're building in potentially a lot of security vulnerabilities. So just by the nature of it, you want to keep that root of trust small and simple, which means that the area and power overhead is much less. And then the other thing you asked about is time to market. Um, and you know, developing secure hardware is, is not as easy and straightforward as it might look uh, when people first start thinking about it. Um, you really need to know what you're doing. So it's starting a new secure core from scratch, building up the security expertise, you know, learning from lots of mistakes, that takes a lot of time. So you know, our recommendation would be that you get a root of trust from someone who has a track record, who has something available off the shelf that you can just easily plug into your design and take advantage of that security. And that's the best way to get time to market with something that really will be secure. This is a different way of looking at security than the traditional way, right? I mean, this, this is sort of a, a hybrid evolution about what started as you seal the perimeter and, and you only allow one way in. Now there's lots of ways. You've got I.O. coming in in every direction. You've got wireless. You've got uh, over-the-air updates on the software. So that's no longer possible. Now you have to really think about where's your data moving? What's the secure part? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why this sort of security logic needs to be smart. It can't just be a dumb engine that sits there and encrypts and decrypts data, which is the approach that you know, has typically been taken in the past. You need something that has you know, some degree of programmability and some ability to look at what's going on in the chip and make sure that nothing anomalous is happening. Um, and you need that to be updatable because your threat models change and the overall system changes. So you need to be able to uh, adapt your security to new threats and, and new environments, which means, again, that your, your security hardware needs to be programmable and configurable and adaptable. And that's particularly true in some of the industrial automotive type of applications too, right? Because these things may be on the road or in, in production for 20 years. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, patching uh, software is a, a very, very difficult problem, as we know, doing that securely. But hardware, you know, can't be patched. So you can't change the, the fundamental underlying hardware. You need some secure way to update the programmable part of the security. And that's, again, where a root of trust should be designed in such a way that it can be updated securely. And once you have that, it can also then be used to securely update other software and firmware in the system. So once you have a root of trust, you can do a lot to ensure that you not only have a, a secure software base, but you can make updates to that in a secure way. As a hardware expert and a security expert, What's your confidence level that the, when you go out and buy a device that it's going to be secure? Uh, I hate to say it, but fairly low, to be completely honest. I think it's getting better, uh, but you know, particularly for something I would go out and buy as a consumer, the, the security level, you know, other than maybe smartphones, which have gotten a lot better, 
the security level in a lot of devices really is pretty low. And, and you know, we're trying to educate people about the fact that there's a really strong need for security and that there are ways to achieve security in a cost-effective way. But a, a lot of companies haven't realized that yet. Ben Levine, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate talking to you.